Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see everybody here today. I'm Liz Mist. I'm president of the League of Women Voters. And I would like to welcome you all to this late spring event. We want to particularly thank our co-sponsors, Facing History and ourselves, as well as AAUW. This is a particularly interesting topic today, and I know you are all going to find it really interesting. And just to let you know, we, we are being recorded. So with one of the league's top priorities being civics education, it's certainly apropos that our event today will shine a light on this critically important topic. A few logistics, please. Mute yourself throughout this presentation and we encourage you to enter your questions in the chat function. We'll get to as many questions as time permits, for those of you who would like to have closed captioning, just click on the CC at the bottom of your screen. We're delighted to have the pleasure of one of our own board members today, Sigrid Pinsky, as moderator for today's program. Sigrid grew up in Palo Alto, has three children who attended Preschool Family, Fair Meadow, JLS, Palo Alto Prep, and Gunn. From personal experience, she has firsthand knowledge of the Palo Alto schools. In addition to serving on our League of Women Voters Board, Secret is currently the EVP of the Palo Alto Community Fund Board of Directors. She also serves on the Santa Clara County Behavioral Health Board and is a member of the Women's Club of Palo Alto. She is working on the team organizing events in celebration of Women's History Month. She's participated in countless volunteer activities served on the boards of many nonprofit organizations, including past board president of the League of Women Voters and president of the Palo Alto Council of PTAs from 2012 to 01, meaning 12 to the next year, and as a past president of the Gun PTA. She's also a past member of the Palo Alto Partners in Education and currently serves on, serves on its advisory board. Secret joined the League of Women Voters in Palo Alto in the early 90s after her husband suggested that yelling at the TV wasn't really accomplishing anything constructive. She then went straight to work on voter service at the League of, at our League, Palo Alto League of Women Voters. We are so lucky to have Secret today. Please join me warmly welcoming Secret, who will kick off our conversation and introduce our guest speakers. Here's to you, Sigrid. Thank Thanks you, for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm looking forward to a lively discussion today. The title of our program is The Road to Democracy Runs Through the Classroom, Preparing the Next Generation of Voters to Be Engaged Citizens. So we're talking about civic education. The California League of Women Voters participated in a task force called Revitalizing K-12 Civic Learning in California. I'm quoting from their report. The success of our nation and state depends on educated, informed, and active citizens and residents. We have much to gain by revitalizing civic learning. The chief benefits of civic learning are a vibrant and informed civic life and democracy and a healthy society. In addition, civic learning done right engages students by making what they learn at school more relevant to real life. Civic learning is also vital to engaging with the issues that confront our increasingly diverse California society. The New York State League puts it a little differently. Effective civic education lessons bring a heightened knowledge to the formal system of government and a better understanding of the forces that can change the balance of power. We hope to develop an improved student understanding of how to be active citizens, knowing their rights and responsibilities. So those are two state leagues weighing in. As you'll see today through our program, inevitably, we need to talk about civil discourse. Before we begin, I just want to run through the logistics of the program today. Uh, first, I encourage you to answer question, enter questions for our speakers into the chat. Uh, we will be monitoring that throughout. Second, please keep yourselves on mute throughout the presentation. It helps us a lot. Um, also, if you want more information from our speakers, um, please enter your name and your email in the chat and we'll save the chat and get back to you. 
Our speakers will each make a brief presentation. Then the speakers and I will have a conversation about this topic. And then time permitting, we will uh, entertain some of the questions from the audience that we've received. A year ago, our democracy was rocked by a capital insurrection. Today, books are being banned in classrooms. Since we announced this event, Ukraine uh, is defending its democracy. Our speakers today, Jennifer DiBrianza and Susie Richardson, will explore civic education in the Palo Alto schools and the essential link between what happens in our classrooms and what happens to our democracy. They will also explain the role of facing history and ourselves in designing and delivering curricula that prepare students to participate in our democratic society. Now I'm gonna introduce our speakers. Jennifer DiBrianza is a former New York public school teacher and staff developer who's worked to support schools and districts across the country in issues of education, reform, and equity. She earned her PhD in education from Stanford University and currently serves on the Palo Alto Unified School Board. Jennifer deeply values the partnership between PAUSD and the League of Women Voters of Palo Alto. Susie Richardson served on the Palo Alto School Board from 1991 to 1999. Today, Susie serves on the Board of Directors of Facing History and Ourselves and has a global lens on the challenges facing educators and students. Susie continues to be involved in local problem, local nonprofits, which work with kids. So now we're gonna to go to our speaker presentations. Jennifer will begin. And perhaps there's no better way to introduce democracy than to hear from John Lewis. For many years, all of us, black and white, Young and old, men and women, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, all of us have been trying to hold this house we call America together. We must build one house. We must build one family. As we face history, as we face ourselves. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to be here today. Um, that was an inspiring sound that we heard. But so our, uh -oh, so our controller knows we can't see the slides. We just heard the slides. And we can't see Jennifer. Oh, here. Jennifer, hmm. I thought I had her spotlighted. I can we, see Jennifer. We can see Jennifer. Oh, you can. Okay. Fixed. It says I am spotlighted, but all we see is your desktop. Susan. It ah. might be playing it on a different screen. Yeah, there we go. I had it on the right screen, but we'll get it. Now I'm big. There you go. Hi, everyone. Okay, Jennifer. So do yep. we do we have the? I mean, okay. So we're, we'll we'll do this first. Sorry for the delay there. Um, so excited to be here with today to discuss this important topic um, and to start hearing. John Lewis's words. I grew up in New York and my introduction to civic engagement clearly started with my mom, um, who talked about these issues all the time at the dinner table, who taught us that our representatives work for us, um, who often wrote letters to the editor to um, uplift her positions and try and convince others. Um, and really, it has been a big part of my life all the way through. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk about this issue. Um, as you all may know, the founding fathers really left the issue of education up to the states. Um, it's not explicitly referenced in the Constitution, but the implication was that states were responsible for providing an education. Um, but knowing the Founding Fathers had a lot to say about what they thought um, about education, um, I went looking for some quotes, and I found a couple good ones. Uh, the quick one I want to share with you right now is um, Noah Webster, who's one of the Founding Fathers, said, I know no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a whole discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. This is the true corrective of abuses of constitutional power. Um, so I just wanted to start by sharing that one with you. I think that really hits the nail on the head of what role education plays in supporting our democracy and saving our democracy and strengthening our democracy. Um, so I'd like to start out by just briefly talking about the alignment from that quote down to the state and the local level. 
and as you can see here on my first slide, um, the California State Constitution states that education is essential to the preservation of the rights and liberties of the people. It says a whole lot more, but that kind of sums it up that um, you know, education isn't just to learn your number facts. There is a role that education plays in making sure that we preserve our democracy. Um, okay, next slide, please. So um, as the state formed, um, there's a department of the California Department of Education who dictates what, what has to be learned in each topic and they have a framework for each subject area. And in the California social sciences framework, um, it talks about civic education and it talks about a constitutional democracy and its institutions depend on citizens who know how government works, understand and abide by the rule of law, vote and serve as jurors, stay informed about and make evidence-based decisions about public issues, imagine that using evidence, um, respect the rights of others, participate in public affairs and seek the betterment of their community, state and country. Um, so they really teased out what was what was meant by the the state constitute what the state constitution meant when they created it. And if we can go to the next slide, that takes us now locally to Palo Alto, and you'll see really how nicely they align. Um, our board policy on civic education is that instruction should promote a student's understanding of shared democratic principles and values, such as personal responsibility, justice and equality, respect for others, civic mindedness and patriotism. Um, and enable students to make their own commitment to these civic values. Um, so really there are many ways that students at our schools, especially our high schools, show that commitment outside of the classroom. There is a postcard writing club, I think at each high school, there are volunteerism clubs, there's equity groups, there's advocacy groups. Uh, we have very strong publications that write about uh, myriad issues. Um, and a good sign that students see themselves as part of a democratic system is that they show up at our school board meetings. Um, and when they do, it's really impressive. They regularly come and raise issues, make requests, sometimes they make demands um, about course options, about equity protection issues, um, concerns that they have. And it's just always extraordinarily impressive. Um, what students do inside the classroom varies as anyone who has been through really any school system um, themselves or their kids know that depending on the teacher, you're gonna get something different but they all cover the content standards, um, which is an important part of civic education, the, the dates and the history and you know that US history information and how the government works. Um, but many teachers work with facing history in ourselves, which we'll hear about soon. Um, and there's always been um, teachers, you know, they get creative to help their students better understand our past, our history and how it shapes us. Um, so if we go to the next slide, before you press play, um, I just wanted to share, it's a little more than a minute, uh, a podcast that was part of an 11th grade class's work just a few weeks ago. The assignment was to take a closer look at a well-known piece of history and to try to make sense of the context, its impact, um, its longer term implications, um, to try to better understand the time and place. So these two students chose to look at the 1963 March on Washington. Um, so if you could press play. Well, when talking about the lead up to the March on Washington, one big name comes to mind, and that is A. Philip Randolph, a labor unionist and a civil rights activist who basically organized and planned the whole march. Randolph was able to gather many other groups to get the attention of hundreds of thousands with the help of some other activists. Philip had already been planning a march for jobs at the nation's capital, and after the marches in Birmingham, MLK had planned a march for freedom. The two activists decided to join together in hopes to gain more people fighting for the same cause in another peaceful protest. Although there was a fear from the president of the time, JFK, A. Philip Randolph was able to convince him otherwise, and the president ended up endorsing the march. Although the march accomplished a lot and was a huge stepping stone for the civil rights movement, there were some people who did not agree with the march, leading to some violent reactions following the march. Now that you know the background of the whole march started, let's get into what we are here to talk about. And the big question, how did the march on Washington lead to the Birmingham bombing? Can you remind us again, what was the Birmingham bombing? Well, Charlie, the Birmingham bombing took place on September 25th, 1963. Now I had heard of the bombing before and studied it a bit, but I never realized it took place just two weeks after the march. The bombing was done by four KKK members by planning dynamite in the 16th Street Baptist Church, which was well known as civil rights meeting spot. 
The attack ended up injuring 14 people and killing four girls. This bombing caused an outrage throughout Birmingham, which led to two more African American men dying. I would say the most shocking part of this event was that there was no trial for another 14 years from this bombing. So just an example of they went to go, they went to go research the March on Washington and they of course didn't realize, they weren't around then, the connection that it had to the, the church bombing. Um, and I love that they're surprised that it went 14 years before any accountability occurred, right? That, that doesn't shock probably any of us at all, but that really surprised them and it gave them more of an idea of really what the reality was on the ground then. Um, so now I think I pass it to Susie. Is Susie spotlighted? Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. I'm sorry. I am on um, Hal's computer. Uh, will you turn mine off? Uh, my computer isn't working. So listen, oh, I see. Uh, thank you so much, um, Sigrid, for the introduction. And it's really my privilege to be here with you. My mom was what my sister and I called a league lady. Um, she was president-elect of the New York State League of Women Voters when she died. And I really got my civic education at home. One of the lessons that was most meaningful to me was going to Albany to, um, to lobby with my mom for something that was called permanent personal voter registration. Amazingly, in the 1960s, even in New York, you had to register to vote every year until that legislation was passed. Jennifer and I were both lucky in that we got our civic education at home from our moms. Facing history in ourselves delivers civic education to thousands of children, uh, actually millions of children, by providing teachers with the tools that they need to inspire students to be active participants in our civil society. We're now gonna play a 60 second video that gives you uh, a story of facing history. Susan, will you start the video, please? We confront history beyond just facts and figures. We empower teachers to ask tough questions and engage students in finding the answers. We equip schools with resources from the past and the tools to face the present. We examine the role of bystanders and upstanders then and now. Facing history is 60,000 teachers and more than 5 million students. Standing up against hatred, racism, anti-Semitism, bigotry, and bullying. There are many classes that teach science, math, and English. There is only one that teaches us to be more human. People make choices. Choices make history. Join us. When I see that video, I can't help but think about what's happening in Ukraine right now. And Facing History is thinking about that too. Tomorrow, we will be offering a teacher webinar to help teachers um, get their kids to reflect and to try to figure out how to respond emotionally and in action to what's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, next slide, please. It's okay, I will just read it. Um, the next slide is a slide from, of a quote from John Dewey. He says, democracy has to be born again each generation and education is its midwife. As the late Congressman John Lewis said, freedom is the continuous action we must all take and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair and more just society. I so appreciate that the League has always been a warrior for democracy. It's time that we realize that our teachers are in the front line for the, in the fight for democracy too. 
we must give them the supplies they need, just as we must give the Ukrainians the supplies they need. Facing History is there to support teachers. We help them connect the history of the past with history in the making. And we help them challenge their students to ask, what is my civic responsibility? How are we going to have civic conversations? How are we going to stand up to bigotry and hate? Susan, can you show the slide of our mission? If not, I'm happy to read it. And I apologize that I'm looking down. I'm using my husband's computer and the camera is very weird. Um, I, I can't quite get high enough to look into it. Um, our mission, so the mission at Facing History is to use the lessons of history to challenge teachers and their students to stand up to bigotry and hate. The next slide, if you can see it, has a lot of words on it, but I'm just gonna emphasize a few which really stand for what we do. Um, we consider human behavior, ethical decision-making, historical understanding, critical thinking, social emotional learning, the complexity of history and connections. History is so much more than a timeline. It's about the conditions that lead to events, and it's about the personal decision-making along the way. The next slide is a circle, and it really, it's, it's about the scope and sequence of how we teach um, about facing history. And at the first point is the individual and society. We help kids consider what is their, who are they? How are they identified? And we also help them think about how they see others identifying them. And what do they do with their identity? How do they find their place in society? We help them engage in the concept of we and they. Who's in your university of, of obligation? Who is your we and who is your they? And then we ask them to go deeply into a case study of history and to carry this understanding of identity and we and they into that case study to look at judgment and memory and the legacy of history. And then at the top of the circle, the place that we really headed to is they're choosing to participate. What are they going to do in history? Um, to sum all this up, Facing History believes that civic education is essential and that good civic education must do five things. It must begin in a learner's learner-centered classroom that values student identities. Students have to be able to find themselves in those lessons so that they can really um, engage with the lessons. We must confront bias and develop a sense of common good. We must engage with the complexities of history. We must introduce current events and controversial issues. And we must nurture students' capacity for both reflection and action. The bottom line is, as it said in the video, people make choices and choices make history. Are we gonna help our children learn to make good choices and be active citizens and participants in civil society? Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Jennifer. We're now going to turn to our conversation amongst the three of us. Um, we're going to do that for a while. And then, as I said earlier, if we can take some questions that have been sent in from the audience, we'll do that. Um, Susan, can we spotlight the three of us? While that's happening, we'll just, we'll just start. Um, Jennifer, I have a question for you. Um, what about learning about the government? What do we teach our students? Yeah, um, that's a that's an important one too, right? Yes, in the in the history social science framework that I mentioned, which is about an eight hundred page document, if you ever want to check it out, um, it lays out in each grade what the what the key um, standards are, and students learn about it all throughout their their time in public school but the the key places are fourth grade eighth grade and tenth grade 
Um, and in fourth grade, they learn about the California government. They learn about the assembly and the Senate. They learn about the parts of, you know, the branches of government um, through the state of California as a precursor. And then in eighth grade, they circle back and they learn about the U.S. and how it connects, you know, how it, how it is a parallel to the California government. Um, and in 10th grade, there's a U.S. government course. And in 11th grade, there's U.S. history. So there's those, those facts and that content um, that is woven throughout, even as we spend our time talking about civil discourse and, and all those other really important things, voter engagement, um, those, those basics get woven throughout all elementary, middle, and high. Great. And if I can add um, to that, uh, Facing History's website uh, provides teachers with a way to um, use Facing History that is aligned point by point with the state curriculum. Great. All right, Susie, how and why did Facing History begin? Oh, well, Facing History began almost 50 years ago when our founder, a woman named Margaret uh, Stern Strom, was teaching. She was a young teacher in middle school in Brookline, Massachusetts. And she had grown up in Memphis, Tennessee at a time when there were white only drinking fountains. And in those days, there were Negro only drinking fountains. And she couldn't understand why she didn't have materials to teach her kids the kind of history that she had lived. And so she set out to um, develop a new, a new way of teaching and that would turned out to be facing history. Terrific. Jennifer, uh, can you tell us about the new California Seal of Civic Engagement? Yes, I can. I'm so glad you asked about that. Um, the California Seal of Civic Engagement is um, is pretty new. It, it um, California presented it, I think, maybe in 2020. Although that might just be when we adopted it. Um, and it, it is a the intention is for uh, the state of California and school districts to encourage students to engage in in civic life. Um, and the League of Women Voters was actually pivotal in helping. PAUSD adopt the California Seal of Civic Engagement Program, and Jennifer Wagstaff um, Hinton really came and advocated, worked with our district to make it happen. So thank you to to her and everyone that worked on that. Um, but basically, there are certain requirements that you need to um, complete U.S. history and um, U.S. government. You need to have at least a C in each of the courses. You need to do community service um, hours, and there's a self, there's a self reflection piece to it and a submission. So the district worked really hard to make sure it was accessible to all students. Um, without any guidance, you could really make it like another thing you have to apply to do, fill out paperwork and, and whatnot. Um, and we, we felt with the district's attention towards equity, there was a, an acknowledgement that there was a good chance that the people that ended up with this seal of civic engagement on your transcript when you graduate we're going to be the kids who are more research, re resourced and whose parents are pushing for them to go fill out the paperwork and whatnot. So our staff worked really hard to make sure that as long as you are taking all the classes you're supposed to take and passing them and you're doing your community service hours, you are automatically earning that seal. Um, so I really I really like that piece of it too. Um, I think that that what I really like about the seal is that it's not only that we're giving kids the idea that these things are worthy of, of gaining a seal and, and worthy of doing, right? We're uplifting them, um, but it also makes them more aware of how we define civic engagement, right? I think when people were coming here today talking about civic education, we might've had all different definitions of what that meant, um, but this is also just by having the seal and, and having the requirements, it's letting kids know what the state thinks of as important ways to engage civically. And I think that really reflecting on that and being aware of those ways you can engage is really important. And, yes. and I should say that this year, um, over 80, we expect that over 80% of our seniors are going to be graduating with that seal of civic engagement on their transcript. Yeah. You know, this is so wonderful. I mean, it's set so much in the spirit of what we do at Facing History. And again, uh, teachers in the state of California can go to the Facing History website and find connections to uh, helping kids earn that seal. It is, it's specifically delineated and is, that work's been funded by uh, something called the Stewart Foundation in San Francisco. Susie, could you say a little bit more about how you connect with teachers? Yes. Um, and that's, that's an ever expanding answer and certainly the pandemic has influenced that. 
Um, we used to have in-person uh, workshops and seminars. Uh, some of them are, are original sort of signature set seminar was a five day in-person seminar where teachers would look at the Holocaust and human behavior and use the model of the Weimar Republic leading into um, the, the Nazis and the reactions um, and the human behavior uh, as a model for teaching history. And uh, now we use um, equity and justice as our signature lens for training teachers. And um, we've pivoted to doing almost everything online. Uh, last year, we found that we, um, I think we increased the number of teachers who were involved taking seminars by four times. We had over 100,000 teachers uh, doing workshops and seminars online. And those could be as short as an hour or multi-day seminars. And in fact, in Palo Alto, we trained um, all the eighth grade teachers uh, in, in, um, in the fall. I think that was a one shot deal. And we had a four part series for district wide, uh, most recently in January and February. Jennifer, you're next. Um, the League of Women Voters of Palo Alto has long advocated to make sure that our young adults are voters. Uh, the Palo Alto League's um, youth vote team's mission is to register, educate, and motivate 100% of eligible Palo Alto teens to become lifelong voters. Um, and as you know, our volunteers visit school classrooms to do all three. What is the Palo Alto Unified School District's position or um, action um, or perspective on voter registration? Uh, yeah, this is another yet another reason why I'm a big fan of the League. Uh, we are so grateful that every year you all, at least before the pandemic, hopefully again soon, um, come into our schools and, and talk to our students. And in California, you can register to vote at the age of 16. You don't have to be, you can register at 16, sort of pre-register, we'll call it. Um, and in our board policy, it explicitly states that the superintendent or designee will be in charge of making sure that all students have access to voter registration in our schools. Um, and uh, so I, I believe, as far as I know, that partnership has been with the League, and the League has come into every U.S. history class um, and, and encouraged students to register, to pre-register, um, to fill out the forms. And before COVID, I guess it was 2019, 2020, 2018, 2019 school year, we had 100 of percent our, of our students who were eligible fill out that form and be registered to vote. Um, and I think it really makes a difference because that tricky thing about, about being able to vote at 18, often you don't even have, usually, you don't even have an election where you are home with your family and you're in your community before you are eligible to vote. So for so many kids, the first time they ever engage in this, they are newly away from home. They are in a place where they maybe don't understand the local politics. Um, so to engage them and get them registered and pre-registered early when they're still in high school, and they can still have these conversations with their parents and with their peers and in school um, is a huge benefit. And, and the league has been a great partner on that and it's baked right into our, into our board policy. You know, of course we I, I applaud the league and, and recognize that, that voting is just the ultimate civil, civic action. Um, and, and the question that we would add is how do you ensure that kids feel the responsibility to vote? What the league is doing is creating this opportunity um, and opening the pathways is so essential. But I think it's also essential for kids to recognize that this is their civic responsibility. That's where we come in. Susie, do you have evidence that you're deliver delivering what the teachers need? Um, I do. Um, I, I have a number here. I think it's. Um, 98, 99% of teachers who've taken facing history seminars uh, recommend it to their colleagues. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty high number. Um, we have a very serious uh, research and evaluation department because we wanna make sure that we are giving teachers what they need. And we wanna make sure that it's making a difference in classrooms. A uh, question for both of you. It's kind of two questions. Um, could you say more about what 
facing history is currently doing in Palo Alto, uh, Palo Alto Unified School District? And how many teachers and students does facing history reach in Palo Alto? So I can, um, there's a lot of different classrooms that Facing History is in right now. Some, some are just classroom by classroom, some are whole grade level groups. Um, they are in our elementary, our middle, and our high schools. Um, they are doing a wide variety of things, uh, but the, the main thread that really is woven throughout is, Sigrid, what you started with is this idea of civil discourse and that the, the only way forward here, <laughs> um, and I think that I see Mara Wallace asked a question similar to this in the, in the chat, that um, that we need to be able to have tough conversations, and it and it needs to there needs to be that space, there needs to be that safety. We need to have that openness to hear each other, to listen, to respond respectfully. Um, that kind of training, if we can teach in our schools, the next generation is going to be a lot better off than we are right now <laughs> because we all see what's going on now, and there's not a whole lot of listening, and there's not a whole lot of um, hearing each other and being open-minded. Um, so th I think the work that Facing History is doing in our schools right now, and, and I think it's happening beyond those classrooms as well, <laughs> um, but certainly in, in the classrooms, there's a focus on this idea of civil discourse and how do we, um, how do we learn from our history and from each other. I think the only thing I would add to that is that our experience has been that when Facing History can be um, taken on as a school-wide initiative and as a district-wide initiative, then you begin to develop a common vocabulary that can be even more powerful. Uh, and, and it's particularly powerful at difficult times to have a school, a, a school community who can talk to each other about uh, these issues. Um, I don't know whether you would be interested in knowing, I have some numbers that we have 7,745 teachers in the Bay Area. Um, we uh, reach about 774,000 kids in the Bay Area. Um, we have 340 million, uh, yeah, 340 million teachers globally, and we reach about 5 million kids globally. Did I do that wrong? My husband's here, he's my number person. We have four, we have 400, uh, 340,000 teachers right. and 5 million kids. Okay, thank you. Um, Jennifer, what role do you think school boards play in ensuring civic education for all students? Um, well, one is encouraging students to speak up at board meetings, right? And hearing them and, and being responsive to them. It really sends a message when they come and say, we want more humanities AP classes, or we feel microaggressions every day in our day-to-day -day experience at school and we need you to deal with them. Um, us letting them speak and, and, and being responsive to them, I think is a big, plays a big part in it. Um, but also my role, you know, as, as a school board member, we are approving curricula. We are approving books. We are um, making decisions about program, about programming. Um, we are uh, in our, just last night in our school board meeting, we talked about our plan for next year. And one of the five main goals is us to, to continue on our equity journey and make sure that everyone is welcome in our schools and has a place in our schools and, and can have a, an experience that is safe from harassment or discrimination so that they have access to their education. Um, and that's really the, the legal basis for it is that we have an obligation to educate everyone and if you have to come to school and face harassment or face ridicule or face hate um, or face marginalization, you don't have access to that education. You are dealing with other stuff that is getting in your way. Um, so we have a legal obligation to make sure every student is welcome in school and can access their education. Um, and you know, you've seen all over the country there are books being banned. And so, I mean, as I'm one of five, I can't speak for our board, but we're not gonna be banning it. I mean. I think as soon as you ban a book, right, everyone goes running to find out what's in it, <laughs> like you want to be banning it about. Um, so no, we, we will have adopted curricula, but I think that our role is to make sure that um, we follow that policy about civic education, that we adopt curricula that are going to teach students about our history, and that we are going to create a culture and climate that makes students feel welcome and, and brave enough to speak up and have these difficult conversations. Thank you. Bravo, Jennifer. <laughs> uh, 
uh, Susie, could you tell us a little more about you, what you refer to as history in the making? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, just referring, as I referred earlier to the fact that we are engaging with teachers around the, the war in Ukraine. Um, this is a history we can't wait to talk about. Uh, it's happening now. Uh, on the uh, January 6th insurrection, we had emails out to teachers throughout our network and curriculum resources out that night so that in the morning of January 7th, teachers could go in and have reflective conversations with their students about the insurrection. Now, I think I should say a little bit about how we do that. Um, we have an emergency response team and we look at the themes of what is happening and then we go back and we look at our resources and how we can take information with similar themes that the kids can use to reflect on. But really the first step is reflection and teachers giving teachers questions that they can use to help their kids reflect on how they're feeling, what they're hearing, thinking about media, what is, what's really happening. And sometimes that's done in a large group class, a large group environment. Sometimes it's a group of maybe two kids talking to each other, maybe it's kids writing. Um, and we have these kinds of responsive around George Floyd, around um, the hostage situation in Colleyville, uh, on and on, we're, we're there. In fact, um, I just saw a learning uh, piece that was sent out to teachers about the new nominee for the Supreme Court. How, how do you talk about that? Terrific. Um, we have time to go to some of our audience questions. Um, and this is questions that we got ahead of time when you registered, you were able to send in a question or two and some that we um, are able to catch from the chat. We don't have tons of time, but um, we'll do our best. Um, for both of you, Jennifer and Susie, um, our district spent a great deal of effort renaming two of our schools. Would you like to comment on that process? Oh, I'd love to comment on that process. It was one of the most unpopular things I have done as a board member and one of the easiest decisions I've ever made, <laughs> which might sound odd. Um, I think that that speaks to exactly, facing history, I'm sure Susie will tell you more about facing history's role in that, but, um, in that issue was brought up to us from a middle schooler who was researching the name of his school. Um, and he found out that the, the um, person his school was named after was a leader in the eugenics movement and had written the California legislation that, that um, allowed for the forced sterilization of thousands of people. So when it came, by the time it came to the school board, I am, you know, I think there's debate about statues and about parks and about everything else. Um, but we were literally asking students of color who would have, you know, maybe they or their parents or their grandparents would have been sterilized to walk into a school every day to learn and to be successful while that school was named after someone who fundamentally explicitly didn't think they were capable of learning. It seemed so crazy. It, it was the it was the perfect example of the embedded racism that exists that we say, oh, it's in the past, everything's equal now. Well, I never had to walk into a school that was named after someone that thought that I was incapable of learning. Um, and so, no, no one's perfect. We, were not, we didn't try to rename them after perfect people. We wanted to rename them after people who didn't have a history or a leading role in making sure to further marginalize students that not only that, that, that had to walk in and, and into our school buildings and learn, but that we historically have not served well. There are, are students of color at any income level. It's not just under-resourced kids of color that we don't tend to serve well. We don't tend to serve any students of color well, under-resourced or you know, kids of professors. So to say we already don't serve them well, and I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that every day they walk into a school named after someone who didn't think they could learn. So that was an easy decision for me, but I know Susie had a role in that before I did, or maybe not Susie directly, but Facing History did. Well, I, I mean, 
it's the action that counts. And Jennifer, again, I'm so proud that you're one of our school board members. Um, but the student did was taking a facing history course when he did the research project. And he felt that he needed to stand up. And uh, we talk about upstanders. Upstanders is actually a word that's being used, fortunately, uh, very freely now. But that word uh, originated in facing with facing history. And then we came in afterwards, we were brought in to teach a unit on eugenics. So that, it, you know, people think that if you remove a name that the history goes away, that's not the issue. It's really what Jennifer was talking about. The, the basic affront and contradiction to our values when you are, have monuments and schools named after people who've done truly offensive things. And so um, we did uh, develop a, U a eugenics curriculum, particularly for uh, Jordan. Thank you. Another question we got, there is currently a lot of discussion around critical race theory being taught in our classrooms. Uh, would you both please comment on this issue? Sure. Uh you you start so as you start I'll, I'll go second this time. well i mean this is an issue that i mean i think the first thing is that critical race theory is not what people are talking about critical race theory is a college level uh, dis, uh philosophy or discipline that people are talking about nobody is teaching critical race theory in our schools in our k-12 schools anywhere it's it's and i think that that's really important to stand up and say this is not critical race theory. But the question is, what do, do, do we erase history? Do kids need to see history? Do kids need, you know, just as a child might walk into a classroom named or a school named after somebody who didn't believe they could learn, what do you do with a child who has a legacy of hatred that they've grown up with, that their family has, has um, has experienced. Don't they have a right to see themselves in the schools? And at Facing History, at this point, we seem to be operating under the radar screen and we don't quite know why. Um, we have a major office in Memphis, Tennessee, and Tennessee was one of the first states to uh, pass these horrible laws, and our teachers are still teaching and we're still supporting them. And we will continue to support them as long as we can. Jennifer? to add? Um, I, I pretty much Susie said it all, but I think that um, I, I echo what she said. No one's teaching critical race theory. I think what people are talking about when they talk about it is anti-racism work, is equity work, is having those difficult conversations about our racial past. And that's hard. Um, I hope that, I mean, some of what, I, some of what I've heard is that uh, some parents have said, my kid came home and feels bad about the fact that he's white. Like it's his, everything's his fault. I hope the parents answer to that is, no, no, not, that's not your fault. That's the reality of our history, right? That, that in, instead of trying to get us to stop talking about our, our history as a nation, to, to help kids further put it in context and understand it, because it is heavy, it's a lot. Um, but we are having conversations about our history, <laughs> we are having conversations about current things that happen today, right? I mean, if you look at how health outcomes for, for um, women, maternal health outcomes, right? You are three times more likely to die in childbirth if, you, if your skin is black or brown than if you're white. In the same hospitals, controlling for everything else, income, location, you know, geography, everything else. There's something there that's not a, oh, well, but, but women of color tend to be poorer. So no, you control for everything else. So there's things going on today that the only chance we have of fixing them is if we acknowledge them, right? That's a, that's a starting point. Um, so I think it is uncomfortable for some people. It doesn't mean we don't do it. It means that we do it responsibly and Facing History is one of the organizations that is helping us figure out how to do it effectively. So, you know, I, I mean, and I think something that's important to point out is that if we're looking at civil rights, for instance, and we're looking at the Freedom Riders going to the South, we talk about black heroes and we talk about some of the white heroes. I mean, you know, white people have done good things too. 
I mean, it, it's not, uh, it's not black and white. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Um, I have some um, general questions about um, the effectiveness of facing history. And then one um, <coughs> question that I think could come under that umbrella is, um, what do we do in our school district and in facing history to make all of this facing history um, curricula accessible to kids with learning disabilities or IEPs or who are struggling in, in different ways? So if we could have effectiveness and, and then that particular. Do you want to start? Sorry. No, could, could you repeat it? You blocked it, you silented it for a minute and I missed the middle of it. <laughs> Oh, I did? Yeah. Um, uh, we're talking about the effectiveness of facing history and also how do we make as a school district and as facing history, make it accessible to our students with learning challenges, IEPs. Um, oh yeah. That kind yeah. Of thing. Um, and when we talk about equity, we mean all of those things, right? Everyone has to have access to their education. So it's not just a racial thing. It's not just a gender identity thing, which I see a little bit of drama in the chat here. Um, it, all students have to have access to their education. So that's um, students with learning differences as well. Um, and those conversations happen in all of our classrooms. So everyone has access to them. And also, I mean, this you might think this related or might not, but one of the things that PAUSD just recently um, started to, a program we started to use is called Learning Ally. And any book, textbook, um, chapter book, you know, whatnot, that, that is available in a library, Learning Ally has an audio. So if you have dyslexia or you have trouble reading or you have a vision impairment or whatnot, you can engage in any of these texts um, audibly as well as visually. Um, so that is one way that we're just making sure all students have access to all of this learning. Um, and, and that's available to any student as well. And, and um, Susie, before I'm gonna interrupt you just briefly, there is a follow-up question in the chat about um, English proficiency as part of, of this outreach. Multilingual. So honestly, I can't answer the multilingual piece. I don't okay. know if you can, Jennifer. I know that we, Okay. Um, I can say that um, our students are twice as likely to be motivated to learn. 81% um, of our students recognize that um, racism and big, that racism and bigotry when they see it and our students are more likely to vote. So, so that's something about effectiveness. Um, there's more than, let's see if I can get this number right. There's more than 4,800 pieces of curricular materials on our website. And they range from personal interviews to videos to um, uh, books and ways to analyze books. Um, you know, if you look up civics um, on our website, you'll get, I think, about 1,100 resources. And so that teachers can adapt these different kinds of resources and choose these resources based on learning styles. I, when I first did a Facing History webinar, or excuse me, a seminar, when I first met Facing History, I joined teachers for five days in an in-person seminar, a residential seminar. And we were given clay and other art materials and asked to make a monument. And there are all sorts of different ways to think about what a monument is. And there are all sorts of ways to, um, to express what you know about that and what you learn about that. And I think Facing History is very good at that. Thank you. Reluctantly, I must bring our session to a close. Uh, thank you everyone for an engaging and provocative and informative discussion. Uh, thank you to our two terrific speakers, Jennifer and Susie. Thank you to our audience. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything you wanted to know, but um, this was pretty great. Um, thank you to the League of Women Voters of Palo Alto and to all those behind the scenes who did a tremendous amount of work to make this happen. Um, especially our thanks to Susie Nowicki, who's been our tech person for the day. Um, uh, one additional reminder, put your name and email in the chat if you'd like more information from our speakers. And please stay on after our last video because our League Events Chair, Myra Lesner, is going to have a few announcements for you. 
So thank you all very much. And we- Wait, wait, before you go to the video, I just want to thank you, Sigrid, and the other league members for bringing this, this conversation to our community. And Jennifer is always my favorite partner. Yes. Thank you. You too, Susie. Thank you, Sigrid, and thank you everyone that, that worked on it with us. But hold on for the video because Dolores yep. is amazing. And now uh, we're going to let Dolores Huerta take the last word on why democracy runs through the classroom. Every single big issue that has been solved in our country has been done by the young people. The civil rights movement, the peace movement, the LGBT movement, the women's movement, it's always been done by the young. They can be the change makers. They have the power to do it. We can make this country live up to its dream. This is what democracy looks like, right? We have to face history to make history. Hi everyone, it's Myra here, um, the, the chair of our events committee. Um, thank you guys so much for um, all of sharing all your knowledge and, and activity and, and action of what's being done in our schools today. Um, really appreciate Jennifer and Susie putting so much into um, being with us today and Sigrid for jumping in and, and being a great moderator. Susan, a wiki, <laughs> we have, we've had technical difficulties and lots of complication, complicated um, asks on this. Um, she graciously jumped in to fill in for Louise Valentes, um, who is on vacation. And where she is is a very unstable, even more unstable than mine. I've had to move like three times to get to a place that I think I won't be frozen um, for myself or for all of you. So um, thanks, everyone. I will say there was a very active chat um, and they all came in at like phew, the, the end. So um, I think what we'll do, I think we should be able to get a copy. Susan, um, hopefully is saving the chat and maybe we can have Jennifer and Susie um, take a little time and, and send back um, some responses to, to, to one of the key ones, some of the key ones, because um, again, when the chat comes in all at the end, unfortunately, we're not, we're not really able to, to get to all of them. I really appreciate all of your questions. Um, and appreciate all, everybody working on this event today, um, and certainly our co-sponsors, as well as all of you who um, took time out of your morning or uh, early afternoon to join us. Um, so I want to just let you know that um, we will be having a record. There is this is being recorded. You probably saw that come up a few times, um, and we will have hopefully this available to actually email to you. We're trying that for the first time. We've actually. Um, wanted to do it before. We think we've got it down so that we'll generate an auto email to you with the link to this recording because I think some of you may just want to listen to it again. I know that I will. Um, and then it will be also on our League Women, League of Women Voters Palo Alto website with a link to YouTube. And we actually house all of our past speaker events on our website. So if in case you missed any, it might give you a chance to go back and see um, what you weren't able to take time to do at the time. Um, and um, what else do I want to tell you? Oh, very important. Um, this, this was a little bit different in terms of our format and uh, certainly a very pertinent topic to us locally. We are sending out a survey monkey and um, I know that everybody gets a lot of, of surveys, but this is really important. We really listen and, and take you know, what you send to us seriously. We're interested in knowing your response to this. We're interested in knowing what you want for future events. Um, you know, as well as where you came from, you know, are you are you our local league members or did we have participants from our co sponsors or sister league so it's very short like less than 10 questions 10 or less questions and um, it will be coming to you in a day or two as well. So um, we appreciate it if you could take a little bit of time for that. Um, also upcoming want to let you know that our annual meeting is coming up in May. Uh, we are slating uh, May 14th. This is the Saturday morning. It will probably be around 9.30 running until 12. We do have a fantastic guest speaker lined up, which I won't share with you quite yet, um, but stay tuned. Save the date, May 14th in the morning on a Saturday, and it will be in person. So we're, we're still figuring out where, where it will be, but this will be the first time that we are getting together in person for over two years, of course, like many, many 
um, organizations and events um, have had a two year uh, lapse due to COVID. So we're feeling pretty good about where we're at with uh, COVID control. Um, and we are looking forward to seeing uh, as many of you and more as possible at our uh, member annual meeting. So I think that's a wrap for today. Thanks everybody for your participation and uh, stay safe and stay well and enjoy when the sunshine comes. Bye now. <laughs>